Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar, where I'm very pleased that we're going to be joined by American Express. And American Express, Katrina Cliff from American Express is going to be talking in particular about 10 benchmarking statistics that will transform your indirect spend management. So I extend to you a very warm welcome indeed. My name is Susie West, and I'm your host for today's session. And to give a little bit of background to those that aren't familiar with sharedservicelink.com, uh, we are a business community that was set up in 2007 specifically to help people in this space improve their processes, improve deliverables, um, improve um, their outcomes. And we do that by extending best practice information um, and through, which is provided by partners such as American Express, but also by a raft of end users. And we extend that information, that best practice information, to you via our webinar series, such as the one that we have today, through our conferences, our masterclasses, and our reports. Please do go online and become a member. It is free, and you have access to a lot of information that will help you improve your um, shared services uh, organization. So let's have a look at what the agenda looks like for today. I'm going to touch briefly on how this session works and then talk about the intention of this session. And then I'll be handing over to Katrina Cliff to talk about, he'll be talking about the 10 benchmarking statistics uh, that will really have a very positive impact on your indirect spend management. And then we'll be taking questions in the last 10 minutes of this webinar. So in terms of how the session works, it's a very straightforward platform go to webinar. But if you should have any technical queries whatsoever, then we do have technical support on the line. Um, all you need to do is to use your free text box in your GoToWebinar panel uh, and submit your question. And uh, that will come to technical support on the line who will be there to respond immediately. Very importantly, though, uh, we at sharedservicelink.com, we talk a lot about uh, um, invoicing. We talk a lot about uh, procuring. We talk a lot about the purchase to pay process. And um, we ha this is the first webinar that we've had specifically on indirect spend management. Uh, and it's a subject that's, that's very much front of mind to, um, uh, to a lot of the shared services organizations at the moment. And I'll come on to that in just a moment. My point being, I would really urge you to use this opportunity to have your questions answered. So this is very much a two-way uh, two dialogue. Please do utilize that. And uh, if I can ask you now just to think about some of the questions that you would like to have answered. Um, and we will be answering those towards the end of the session. So let's have a look at the intention of this session. As many of you know, um, sharedservicelink.com was approached in uh, 2010 to be involved in an American Express study. And American Express came to sharedservicelink.com specifically because they wanted to uh, get a real appreciation of the maturity of the indirect spend market across Europe. So uh, we were very heavily involved in that project. And um, Katrina will share the, the the uh, results with you in terms of how many people participated in the sample size. But we're talking about a very extensive and profound study. It's certainly one of the most extensive and profound studies in this market space that I am aware of. And believe me, we do, we're do. we very aware of a lot of reports um, in, in purchase to pay and in finance shared services. So in terms of number of people, it was well over 150 people in this, in this space that responded. And it's one of the longest. Um, and most detailed studies, as I said, that I've come across, uh, most responses took about 45 minutes. Um, so you can imagine the level of detail that came back in the results. Now, the results were surprising, because I think there's a general understanding that some, some organizations um, do practice uh, do put certain practices in place, do put certain rules in place. And of course, there is always going to be um, somebody or a group of people that undermine certain practices. But I think uh, if we come down to uh, the second bullet um, that's slightly inserted, what was sho almost shocking to me was that good practices that had been um, uh, rolled out within organizations were being undermined to a much greater degree than I certainly appreciated initially. And what I think this brought home was that 
um, it was no good rolling out good practices and having rules, if you were in the organization, um, that are rolled out with a very good intention if they will continue to be undermined. And what this report came back with was that there are very large organizations with high volumes of transactions, high volume of high, high value of spend, um, and because um, certain rules aren't being followed and because of the lack of compliancy, um, there's basically money being left on the table. The, pro the purchase to pay process specifically around indirect spend is much more costly than it should be. And because of the lack of compliance in it, um, it's leading to all kinds of problems around a lack of visibility and a lack of control. So indirect spend, indirect, indirect transactions have really historically always been the poor relation in purchase to pay. Uh, shared services organizations and, and really most organizations generally, shared services or not, have always treated direct spend really as the kind of the, the favorite child within purchase to pay and have really wanted to put full attention on getting that right. Purchase orders have always um, historically been associated with, with direct uh, purchasing rather than indirect. And indirect really has been the poor relation. So now it's very much a, a key focus of organizations. Um, and I'm looking forward to introducing Katrina Cliff, uh, because she joins me today, uh, to reveal what the top 10 findings of this report are. And uh, it's very much um, presented to you today with a view that you can take away these tips and have a look at your own organization and see what you're doing uh, right and, and really the areas in which you can uh, push some improvement. So Katrina Cliff is a VP and General Manager um, at American Express um, and she's going to be uh, drilling into the detail now and I'd uh, like to pass over to you please Katrina and uh, we we'll look forward to the top 10 tips. Thank you very much, Susie, and thanks for um, allowing us to join you today on sharedservicesLink.com um, and share um, the uh, results, really, of our European Indirect Spend Management Study for 2011. Before um, I get into the detail, um, really what I want to talk you through um, uh, is some of the context around how we came up with the top 10 benchmarking statistics. Um, and really, you know, the first thing is, talking about why focus on indirect spend management, and more particularly, why right now? Why is 2011 the right time to look at it? The second thing I want to cover is really how we developed the study and what the objectives of the study were. Thirdly, what our approach was and our approach for our partners as well, and also the response mix which we achieved. And then finally, really, what our respondents actually told us they were focused on and how this aligns with um, the indirect spend management study for Europe too. So what I want to do first of all, before we get into the detail, is hand over to you, Susie, to do a quick poll. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. So uh, let's have a look at how much of your uh, organization spend is indirect today. You have a poll on your screen. What percentage of your organization spend is indirect today? Please tick the box. Most appropriate to your own situation, is it less than 10%, 10 to 30%, sorry, 1 to 10%, 11 to 25%, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75%, or 76%, and over. If you can tick the box, most appropriate to your own landscape, uh, your own indirect spend landscape. What percentage of your organization spend is indirect today? Um, if you haven't already responded, please do so. We do like to make sure we get as high a response as possible. So far, we have 62% responding. So those of you that haven't responded, please do so. What percentage of your organization spend is indirect today? 1 to 10%, 11 to 25, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75%, or 76% or over. 74% um, of you have voted. I'll be closing the poll in 3, 2, 1. Let's have a look at the results. Coming up on your screen now. So you can see a little bit of a bell curve there um, with uh, the majority of you responding, uh, just over 75% of you with between 11 and 50% of your organization's spend is indirect spend. Back to you, Katrina. Thank you, Susie. And that's actually quite interesting because when we ask our own customers, 
this question um, you know, in a sort of spontaneous way that we've just done now. Most people massively underestimate the amount of indirect spend they actually have, so it's quite interesting the percentage that, uh, that thought that uh, their companies was around sort of the, the sort of 30, 40 percent mark. What we typically find for businesses that are not manufacturing, it's around 50 to 70 percent, and sometimes significantly more than that as well. So I think that was quite an interesting, interesting example. What I want to do now is really talk about why um, we initiated the study um, in Q3 of, of last year, Q3 2010, and put some context around it. And I think really everybody is aware that the world has changed quite significantly um, between sort of third quarter of 2008 and now. And I think the economic challenges that we all faced, as every organization I think across Europe faced, has reshaped the way that we actually look at managing our internal processes and forced us to look even more around cost control and compliance. You know, we thought we were doing it pre-2008, but really now it is a very significant area of focus for most businesses. And this really dramatically changed the finance and procurement environment, with organizations looking at balancing the three key areas of driving growth, achieving cost savings, at the same time meeting regulatory requirements. And if you think about the first two, to drive growth and achieve cost savings at the same time is a real challenge for us, for us all. Um, so as a result of this, many organizations have significantly improved their overall management of T&E expenditure. However, one of the things that we've found and we've really understood from you know, being in this business is that indirect spend remains a significant opportunity. And we've estimated that opportunity to be around 1,300 billion euros across Europe. And I think there are really three areas of opportunity in this non-T&E um, area. The first is around improving control. The second is about maximizing visibility and thirdly, around driving efficiencies. And I'm going to talk more about all of those three today. But really, that's why we felt that this was the right time to look at indirect spend. In terms of developing the study itself, um, we had already, um, over previous years, between 2003 and 2008, um, implemented T&E expense management studies. Um, our focus, though, is on ensuring that we continue to develop, deliver fresh insights to both organizations that we work with and organizations that we'd like to work with. Um, and this is why we felt indirect spend was a great place to start in 2010, 2011. Um, so in terms of partnering with people, we felt that AT Kearney was a clear choice to support us in leading the study development and the analysis of the study as well. And really that's based on their understanding of our business, of the American Express business, and also their, uh, their, their proven expertise in the procurement and, uh, and analytics space. Susie also mentioned at the beginning that, uh, that they worked with us on this study. Um, and we really chose to engage Shared Services Link.com to support us in extending the study to its membership base and really making sure that the results that we got, the input that we got, was both significant and robust in terms of the results. So the goals of the study, I think, were, were really threefold. Firstly, to help procurement or finance professionals identify indirect spend trends and best practices across a variety of markets across Europe and also a variety of, variety of different industries. Secondly, to ensure the insights were relevant for all European markets and organization sizes, and they're not just focusing on, on large organizations. Um, and then secondly, to bridge the gap in European specific insights, because most of what, we have, uh, what we've seen in the market and what we've looked at um, prior to initiating the study was really focused very much on North America. So in terms of you know, putting some context around it, hopefully that, that's helped um, to, to develop an understanding as to why we thought now was the right time and why we thought indirect spend was the area to focus on. Um, what I want to do now is take a little bit of a closer look at the objectives of the study um, in terms of uh, or with respect to indirect spend management. Firstly, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to highlight challenges 
that companies are finding, and also see if we could identify some specific trends that were happening in the area of indirect spend. Secondly, and I think this is a particularly important one for me, is to actually be able to quantify the size of the opportunity for companies where their management of indirect spend is very effective. I think when we've reviewed past studies in the marketplace, many of them didn't take it to the level of being able to quantify these opportunities, so that was a very definite cap gap that we wanted to, uh, to fill. And then thirdly, you know, what we also wanted to do is to support both the companies that took part in the study and others that would, we wanted to share the study with in terms of how um, they could build plans for the future to become more effective at indirect spend management, provide some strategies and some tactics around that. In terms of actually the study itself, um, we took uh, what we call a four-pronged approach ensuring that we got a high number of responses and that the insights that we were able to develop were, as I said, in-depth, robust, and significant. The four elements of the approach were firstly to do an online survey, reaching a high number of procurement and finance professionals, both customers and non-customers of American Express, importantly. This was across all markets, all segments, and trying to get a broad range of industry input. The second step was to hold in-depth interviews to discuss some of these responses in more detail, focusing really on the challenges and best practices respondents highlighted in the survey responses. And then thirdly, we used subject matter experts, um, discussions with both um, American Express internally, customers, and a review of AT Kearney procurement and analytics research to help us provide sort of that level of expertise. And then finally, um, developing the key insights by synthesizing both this primary and secondary research. So I think a very comprehensive approach to the study was taken. In terms of the responses, we, we believe that actually this study represents the largest of its kind in Europe. We uh, had 162 respondents. 42% of these were, were from mid-sized organizations. And by mid-sized, those are companies with revenues of between 2.3 million euros and 572 million euros. Um, and 58% uh, was from large organizations, which obviously is revenue over 572 million and employees of more than 500. We had a strong participation from both customers and non-customers across UK, France, Germany, Spain, and the Nordics. And these organizations represented nearly 1 million employees across the piece. So I think that shows that it's a comprehensive um, study in terms of the representation across Europe and representation from different sizes of companies. More importantly, um, I think I believe that actually the study is unique in terms of its scope. Um, you know, we were talking to companies with representing annual revenues of over 247 billion euros. So clearly, you know, those, these are companies with significant indirect spend. Um, and the spend, the annual spend of these companies is over 127 billion euros. Clearly, as I mentioned at the beginning, a big chunk of that 127 billion will be indirect spend. You know, there were 30 different industries re um, represented also with a mixture of, you know, chemicals, uh, professional services, engineering, telecoms, and medical equipment all being in the top five. So a very broad scale of industry representation. The interesting thing is the key areas of focus that, uh, that our respondents actually confirmed for us. And what uh, this slide shows really is that control compliance, sourcing, process efficiency are all key areas of focus. More specifically, within control and compliance, 56% said procurement savings are a top priority for their organization. In sourcing, by far the most a uh, significant area of focus was negotiations with suppliers um, and spend visibility. And then from a process efficiency perspective, 52% noted that processing speed within procure to process is of strategic important, importance. 
However, also on the agenda was a reduction or reallocation of headcount at 42%. And I think this is, uh, this is an important area that we're going to come on to later when I go through the, uh, the top 10 benchmarking statistics. So I want to hand over again to Susie for, uh, for another quick poll. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. So which key areas of focus are top of mind for you in 2011 and 2012? This is a multiple choice response, so you don't uh, need to just tick the one box. So um, of those three, um, which one resonates with you the most in terms of um, the, one that is, or the one or the two that are front of mind for you right now and carrying on into 2012? Improving control, maximizing visibility, or driving efficiencies. It might be all three, it might be specifically one, or maybe two. 53% uh, of you have voted, uh, so if you haven't already cast your vote, please do so. It makes the response uh, data much more meaningful, the more of you that respond, up to 70%. So closing the poll in three, two, one, with 73% of you responding. So thank you very much for that. Let's have a look at the data now. Uh, so interesting, actually, cl uh, two clear winners there, 72% improving control, 41% maximizing visibility, and 69% driving efficiencies. Back to you, Katrina. Thank you very much, Susie. And yes, I think that is very interesting. I think you know what we'll find as we go through the benchmarking study is all of those three aspects do um, get a number of different mentions. And interestingly, maximizing visibility, I think, increasingly is an important area, but, um, but, but we'll talk about that as we, uh, as we go through the study. I think um, there are three really what we call striking opportunities um, that really surprised me um, when we went through the study. I think the first of those around driving efficiencies is that pure automation has not improved the resource and processing efficiency. Um, and this really points to a big opportunity to make sure that you know, better practices are implemented and are, the automation is aligned with what's going on in the rest of the business. I think the second um, striking opportunity is that you know, despite um, I think an estimated 10 billion euro investment in ERP systems over the past five years, these technologies are not being applied to gain maximum benefit, maximum benefit for the organization. There remains poor spend visibility and accuracy, and this results in ineffective sourcing. And I think really what we've estimated is that represents the, the study participants over 900 million euros in potential savings. Um, and obviously, this can be applied more broadly to all organizations, not just those that took part in the study. And then thirdly, I think you know, we found some significant compliance gaps in key areas in the organization, which really means you know, you've got money being left on the table. And I think, as, as, as Susie highlighted at the beginning, I think organizations are not achieving a best practice model of end-to-end -end indirect spend management through well-embedded support processes. So what I want to do is now go through the top 10 benchmarking statistics in each of these areas. But before we do that, I'm going to hand over again to Susie to, uh, to do a quick poll. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Christina. So has your organization focused more on implementing and using uh, e-purchase orders or e-invoices? So tick the, the button which is more appropriate to you, electronic purchase orders mainly, electronic invoices mainly, perhaps you have equal focus on both, or perhaps neither. So has your organization focused perhaps a bit more on implementing and using e-purchasing and e-purchase orders, or more on electronic invoicing? So the four options available, more on e-purchase orders, more on e-invoices, perhaps equal focus on both, or perhaps neither. 70% of you have voted. If you haven't voted, please do so. And I'll be closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results coming up on your screen now. So you can, again, see um, a couple of clear winners there. So 39% uh, equal focus on both. And then coming in second place, interestingly, 29% of you electronic purchase orders seem to have 
been the winner as far as your company's attention is concerned. Back to you, Katrina. Thank you very much, Susie. Um, so now here we go into the top 10 benchmarking statistics from our European spend management study. And interesting results from that poll. Um, you know, obviously, equal focus on both was, was the top scoring. But actually, the majority of you said that um, purchase orders uh, was your main uh, focus area, and that is supported by, um, by the respondents to our survey as well. So I think really the point of the, the first um, benchmarking statistic is that organizations confirmed there has been a mixed focus on moving to uh, electronic. Neither are used um, predominantly, and uh, which I think is, is, is an, interesting, uh, an interesting element. So to understand the efficiencies around electronic um, invoicing and purchase orders, we actually focused on a, a series of different questions on electronic invoices and purchase orders to gauge the overall level of procure-to-pay automation. And as a baseline, as I've mentioned, really the purchase order, electronic purchase orders are more prevalent, um, with only 26% reported using electronic invo invoicing. This is However, in line with industry trends, so showing that, that the study um, is representative of, uh, of the industry in general. Um, but it has resulted in matching and settlement challenges, as noted by Cadera, and they are a gaming and casino company in Spain. And Jose Luis Bastia highlighted the efficiencies that are achievable when moving to electronic and the accuracy and settlement challenges that still exist when operating in a paper environment. And that paper environment is really for some of the smaller organizations that he works with. Um, but you know, he gets that efficiency um, for those larger organizations. So moving on to the next benchmarking study, number nine, or benchmarking statistic number nine. This is still um, talking about electronic invoicing. And organizations reported that there is a benefit to moving to electronic invoices, and that benefit is significant in terms of reducing management time required, or more precisely, the cycle time for invoicing. And if you look at the chart, really, the respondents in the study reported an average of 11.2 days in cycle time um, uh, reduction when there was a higher proportion. Higher proportion is 60% plus of electronic invoices. And this was achieved mainly by, as I said, reducing the management time required in the process. And that's the light gray box at the end of each of those bars. So the, it's the management time element that has seen the significant decrease by electronic invoicing. Moving on um, to uh, benchmark number eight. And this was quite counterintuitive in terms of what, what we've seen before. but as a result of automation, we are not seeing a reduction in resource requirements. And I think this is what I talked about earlier, where processes are not aligned and manual, manual intervention is still required, even though automation has been invested in. And let me just take you through the graph on the slide. Um, the first one represents large organizations on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, um, that represents mid-sized organizations. Along the x-axis, um, along the bottom, this represents the percentage of electronic purchase orders and invoices, while the y-axis represents the average FTEs involved. And if we look across the x-axis and the number of electronic invoices in the organization, you would expect to see that the more electronic invoices the fewer FTEs required. However, um, this is clearly not the case. Um, and you know, on both large organizations and mid-sized organizations, there is no relationship between electronic and efficient processes. And this was quite a surprise to us as we went through the study. And actually, you know, in our research, one organization actually emphasized this point when it revealed that although 95% of their purchase orders and invoices were electronic, each one then had to be manually reviewed to ensure accuracy. 
So I think the point here is that organizations need to ensure that their tools and processes are aligned at the same time so you get the full benefits of automation. And there clearly are some great benefits, um, but processes and tools need to be aligned at the same time. And then moving on to number seven, there is limited correlation between usage of electronic invoices and internal efficiencies. And I think to highlight some of the earlier points, electronic invoices don't translate into more internal efficiencies. And pure automation on its own is not necessarily better automation. And again, you know, this was quite a surprise to me. And so what we wanted to understand is why, why was this the case? So again, looking at this graph, the x-axis represents the percentage of electronic invoices and the y-axis represents the first time match rate percentage and early payment discount lost. So as we plotted the data um, from our respondents to our study, we expected to see the first time match rate slope upwards and the early payment discount lost slope downwards as we move along the x-axis. And that would indicate a positive correlation between the use of electronic invoices and internal efficiencies. As you can see, you know, there is a slight uplift, but it's very, very small. And respondents told us that electronic invoices have not resulted in higher first-time match rates or indeed a decrease in early payment discounts lost due to late payment. So again, not gaining the benefits of automation um, because processes and the tools are not aligned. So, Back to you again, Susie, for another poll question. Thank you very much, Katrina. Again, coming up on your screen, please, if you could respond to this question. In what uh, what number of what percentage of indirect categories do you believe you have good item level visibility today? Not to ten percent, eleven to twenty five percent, twenty six to fifty percent, fifty one to seventy five percent, or seventy six percent or over. So just to uh, say that question one more time. In what percentage of indirect categories do you believe you have good item level visibility today? So 0 to 10%, 11 to 25, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75% or 76% or over. Closing the poll because we're at about 70, 74%. Closing the poll in 3, 2, 1. Let's have a look the data. So, appearing on your screen now, you can, again, it's, uh, as you can see, a bell curve there, but with around, certainly, um, over, f about 45% of you uh, believing that you've got good visibility at, at line, at item level, um, under 25% uh, of your indirect spend category. So, um, interesting result there. Back to you, Katrina. Thanks very much, Susie. And that's really what we're going to move on to now is, is item level visibility. Um, so again, interesting poll. Um, our respondents were probably slightly more positive uh, about their item level spend visibility. Um, and what this chart shows, um, we've actually split out between American Express customers and non-customers. Um, and as we go through most of the charts going forward, they will split out American Express customers and non-customers. But what the study confirmed is that item level visibility still remains a challenge um, in indirect spend versus direct spend. But actually, this remains a critical part of effective procurement and sourcing. 40% of organizations reported that they do not have the analytics to know what exactly they're buying. Um, and clearly, this is means that your procurement is going to be ineffective. In particular, the Nordics actually reported poor visibility, whereas Germany reported the strongest visibility. And this clearly varies by, by, by commodity and by sector type. When we look at how organizations, both American Express customers and non-customers, feel about their levels of item visibility, the percentage of organizations with poor item visibility is particularly high in marketing and advertising, professional services, and overhead in general. And I think some reasons for this include, um, in, in direct spend, SAP provides very tight controls. It provides that level of visibility. 
While in indirect spend, the spend cubes organize, organizations often leverage don't provide that item level detail required to challenge specs or inform negotiations. Interestingly, you know, American Express customers do have better item level, level visibility than non-customers. Moving into benchmark statistic number five, so we're halfway through now. Um, and I think, you know, this, this is again moving on from the last, uh, the last statistic, um, very interesting and, and possibly slightly worrying response is that even those organizations that do believe they have good item level visibility um, don't believe that that information is really reliable. And, you know, again, we've split it um, by organization size and by American Express customer and American Express non-customer. So 30% of large organizations believe there is still room to improve, and 37% of mid-sized organizations believe the information could be more reliable. And I think if we look at that by customer versus non-customer, 31% of American Express customers believe their item level visibility could be better, while non-customers come in somewhat higher at around 39%. So key point here is even when you do have that item level visibility, you're still not sure that it is accurate. Moving on to uh, number four, um, again, very interesting statistic is that two in three organizations don't actually capture the item level details they need to drive effective sourcing. Um, and I think what we've highlighted here is the reasons that the, the companies gave for that. Um, I think this reasonably equal balance before those, you know, balance between those four key reasons. Um, and they include poor compliance, transactions not being captured in the system, no item level details, which we've talked about before, and a lack of system integration. And I think this is particularly evident in some specific spend categories, like office supplies. And we held a recent conference for some of our um, larger clients within Europe. And time and time again, what they shared with us is that their organizations had an inability to understand what they were actually buying and if those right items and if those items were actually being correctly categorized. Um, however, um, I think organizations do see the value in making progress in this area, um, and they see it as being important to actually overcome these challenges. And we have a quote from um, ABB. Um, from their assistant vice president there in terms of the importance of capturing line item data and, and the fact that it is increasingly important in terms of it making your procurement more efficient and more effective. So back to you again, Susie. Um, another poll question before we move on to our, our final three findings um, around improving controls in organizations. Thank you very much, Katrina. So what categories of indirect spend do you believe require more robust controls today? This is multiple choice. You're not obliged just to take one. Marketing and advertising, professional services, overhead in general, facilities, and or logistics. So it's a multiple choice. Please do tick all the boxes that you think really do apply to you as far as the categories of indirect spend that you really do believe require more robust controls, which um, the knock-on effect would be to obviously give you um, a, rich, a richer and more uh, meaningful data set, a uh, complete uh, line-level data set, uh, which you can translate into very meaningful information and base decisions off that. So 64% of you have voted. Uh, please, the remainder of you that haven't, uh, please do respond. We're closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results. We have 67% of you responding there. So coming up on your screen shortly. Again, we've got two clear winners there. Professional services probably won't come as a surprise to any of you, uh, followed by overhead and general. Back to you, Katrina. Thank you very much, Susie. And we are obviously going to go on now into um, a kind of preferred supplier 
lists and uh, interesting results around professional services. Um, the interesting thing is that a third of indirect spend does not comply to preferred supplier lists. And even though respondents confirmed that procurement had a, a major focus on driving the use of preferred supplier lists, um, and it was a, a very early step in, in creating a professional procurement area, it was still a challenge for them. I think what we found is that large organizations tend to be um, uh, to use preferred supplier lists more frequently than mid-sized organizations. And interestingly, again, American Express customers are more inclined to use preferred supplier lists than, uh, than our non-customers. Yet only two-thirds of the indirect spend complies to these lists. And I think if you look at the chart, um, the, the, the green boxes uh, highlight some of the areas that I think are, are worth talking about a little bit more. 71% um, and 68% for customers and non-customers respectively, um, you know, compliance in IT and, and, and telecom. Um, interestingly, I would certainly have expected to see a much higher percentage in this, uh, in this area. Given that uh, you know you have very specific requirements around IT and telecom, um, and it, it's an area that typically is is, is well controlled within organisations, and and also um, very often develops specific partnerships with key suppliers in this area. Marketing and advertising, interesting as well, also represents a very large opportunity, and many organisations report uh, what we call a, a tail of low spend across many suppliers. Now. I'm actually not too surprised about that because if I think about you know, a number of organizations, there are different requirements and needs for marketing and advertising. Different agencies are better at different things and very often companies do use smaller, local, cheaper um, uh, agencies for some activities and larger organizations for other activities. So not so much of a surprise but still a big area of opportunity. And then overhead in general in industrial equipment, um, time and time again in conversations um, was one where, you know, significantly uh, big opportunities in those areas. At a market level, um, Spain, uh, organizations in Spain were the least compliant, while France at 76% was the most compliant. The UK um, was broadly in line with, uh, with our survey results. And I think, as I said earlier, this, this really uh, the preferred supplier list creation is a first step in developing a robust procure-to-pay process. Um, but actually, only a small percentage of organizations appear to be operating it effectively. And I think, you know, although every organization needs to, uh, to determine the level of flexibility that's right for them, one respondent did in fact report that if a supplier was not on a preferred list, they were not paid. I think this is probably a bit extreme for, uh, for most, most of us in our organizations, but it, it gives you one uh, approach to, uh, to controlling your expenditure. So very close to the end now in terms of benchmarking statistics. On to number two. Even when you have preferred suppliers, a third of indirect spend does not comply to contracted rates. Um, similar. Um, slide in terms of the, the chart showing uh, the various different sectors. Um, but in terms of moving to contracted rates, and we, we've defined contracted rates as, as agreed pricing with specifications or an agreed rate card, we actually see lower usage rates than in preferred supplier lists. There are similar trends to those of preferred supplier lists in terms of large organizations versus mid-sized organizations and American Express customers versus non-customers. But again, only two-thirds of total indirect spend is known to comply with contracted rates. So what exactly is happening in the third of, of, of the indirect spend that isn't known to be compliant? I think there's, there's two scenarios where money is, uh, is, is being left on the table. Buyers are buying off catalog, um, and incorrect rates are being spoke, quoted for the wrong specification. And you know, as with preferred supplier lists, I think we see enormous opportunity in marketing and advertising, and overhead in general, and industrial equipment. And I think. We also um, have some anecdotes uh, from some of our respondents um, to support this evidence. 
you know, in, in one of our interviews, we actually uncovered that an organization had no controls in place to enforce contracted rates. Even though it had rate cards, it had no way of telling whether the rates being quoted were compliant with those rate cards. And actually, some analysis by AT Carney that they've done in the past, um, in partnership with another client, revealed over $1 billion in savings could be made by complying to contracted rates where they weren't at the time. On a market-by-market -market basis, um, organizations in the Netherlands were the least compliant at 57%, while again, we saw France as the most compliant market at 69%. And again, UK was broadly in line with the survey results. So finally, um, benchmark statistic number one. I think this is, you know, we put this as number one because I think it's a critical part of creating a, a culture of compliance. And over half of the organizations that participated in the study did not have controls in place to manage non-compliance. So I think the question we asked is why are organizations not complying um, with supplier lists and contracted rates? And the reasons that the companies gave us was they have no controls in place to identify it, and they don't offer incentives to comply. Or alternatively, there is a, a lack of culture of accountability or consequences for non-compliance. So if you don't comply, there is no consequence of that non-compliance. And we believe that, the, that improving control and compliance is probably the most important statistic to come out of this study, certainly the most interesting in terms of our respondents, and really is, is a first step in developing what we believe to be best practice around end-to-end -end processes. So if I wanted to, to summarize, I think there are three key takeaways that I would like um, like everybody to, uh, to remember from today's session. I think the first one is that only two-thirds of indirect spend is known to be compliant. So clearly compliance is a major challenge for all organizations, whether large or mid-sized. 40% of organizations don't actually have good item level visibility for their indirect spend, and this is absolutely key in supporting effective sourcing and enabling you to negotiate effectively with your suppliers. And then thirdly, automation on its own does not appear to increase an organization efficient, an organization's efficiency. And you know, I think this is certainly, if I think about my own clients with American Express, I think this is one of the, the key takeouts that they have uh, had from the study, whether they've participated or not, is that the expected benefits of auto automation aren't there unless you have the processes and the internal alignment in place as well. So how do you... Uh, what, what, what can you do about this? How does an organization make progress on these opportunities? I think what we see within American Express, and certainly what we came out of the indirect spend study, is that best practice organizations are moving to really much more of a closed loop approach, where procure to pay is managed in a much more integrated way. Firstly, back office controls are a, a, a critical first step. Every organization needs to find the right balance of, of before the event controls and after the event controls, so the reporting after the event. Um, and for some organizations, different controls for different commodities may be the best approach. And you know, when we looked across all the different commodities, um, clearly some of those were, were better managed than others, um, maybe because they represented significantly more spend than others, but maybe that is the right approach. Our second recommendation is that organizations implement a feedback loop to communicate supplier-based data and ensure that non-compliance and bottom line costs of this are visible to end users. And I think this communication and the feedback loop is absolutely critical. So individuals managing their own P&L understand where their expenditure is going and that there are big opportunities to improve it by complying, um, whether it's a preferred supplier list or with contracted rates. And then our final recommendation would be to focus on efficiencies through, I guess, a top-down risk-based approach. 
And this is where many of the products and services, including our own corporate payment solutions within American Express, are available to organizations and clearly can have a significant impact. And I think one final point, and I, I touched on it earlier, is that organizations should not underestimate, I think, the power of organizational culture. You know, you could have all of the processes in place, but if people don't follow them or are not compliant with them, they won't benefit you as an organization. So it is about shifting behaviors um, and communicating effectively to create the environment that, uh, where everybody um, focuses on improving control, maximizing visibility, and driving efficiency. So Susie, I'm going to hand back over to you now for, uh, for any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. That was a very comprehensive breakdown of all the, the, the key results that came out of that um, very, very extensive uh, report. Um, I'm absolutely sure that as a result of those, those you know, top 10 findings, you'll want to read that report. Um, I've, I've read it. Um, obviously, I've read it. I was involved in it. Um, it is a, a very useful tool for people in this space to make changes. Um, one key thing that we come up again and again is organizations just struggling to get buy-in, um, meeting resistance when they want to drive through changes within their purchase-to-pay organization. And what you do need is data. You need hard data to go and sell the, sell the, the vision for you. So please do use this as a tool to go and get the support from senior level management, uh, C-level management perhaps, that you need to drive through the the improvements um, that you are after. Uh, please visit uh, americanexpress.co.uk forward slash visibility um, and there you'll be asked to fill in a form and then you will get your own copy of uh, the the um, results. So thank you very much for that, Katrina. Now, in terms of questions, we've got a number of questions uh, that have come through. Just to remind you how questions work, we have another um, about eight minutes for questions. Uh, you have a free text box in your GoToWebinar panel. Please do submit your questions via that. Um, Katrina and I are both taking questions. Uh, our shared services link.com was a partner in this. Um, then I, um, again, I'm, I'm well placed to answer your questions too. So both Katrina and I will be taking your questions now. And just before we go into questions, I'd um, just like to ask one final uh, poll for you, please. And uh, maybe answer this whilst you're thinking of the question that you'd like to ask both me and Katrina. If you do not currently have a card solution in place to manage indirect spend today, would you consider one? Yes, you would. You'd like to, and you'd like to find out more? No, uh, you wouldn't. Uh, perhaps you would, maybe, or maybe it's not applicable. So please do tick the box which is most appropriate to you. Um, so let's go straight into questions uh, that I've got. And I'd like to put some of these to you, Katrina. So in terms of the actual survey, um, the study respondents, the 162 respondents that um, that have participated in the study, were they more finance or procurement? That's a question that I've got coming through from a couple of viewers. Okay, so that, that's thanks, Susie, for the, the question. Um, interesting question. I mean, obviously, we had a very broad range of industries, a very broad range of markets, but actually, in terms of the split between finance and procurement. It was around 50-50 um, in terms of, of those responding. So actually, I think from a study perspective, again, very good because it gave us broader scope, it gave us greater insight, and I think um, more relevance to the responses, the fact that we had both procurement and finance professionals responding to us. Okay, good. Um, and a question that's come through on uh, the definition, what is the definition of um, e-invoicing? Because obviously that was a key part of the, um, the, the scope. And I'll, I'll pick that one up if I may. Um, so what was covered, covered in the definition of electronic invoicing was um, the receipt of a, of a, of a data-based invoice. So not a PDF coming in from your supplier. Um, but an invoice coming in very much in a, as a data file, so be it EDI or be it through um, an e-invoicing network. So please do keep your questions coming. Question back to you, please. 
Katrina, um, so obviously that you the, the boiled down, you boiled it down so that there were about twelve uh, telephone interviews that you um, carried out. W were there any surprises that you stumbled across in those actual uh, telephone interviews? Um, I, I, to be honest, I think there were a lot of surprises from from all of the responses that we got. But I think um, I think that there were probably two themes that we heard um, were around accountability and uh, and the deploying of resources. And, uh, and I think that was in terms of, I guess, best practice um, and uh, best practice at some organizations and the fact that these highlighted significant gaps, surprising gaps in other organizations. Um, and I think, I guess, the other thing is that there are many different approaches to managing indirect spend. Um, and I think, you know, the difference is that for some organizations, uh, it begins with compliance. Um, whilst with others it's focused solely on maximizing the visibility of spend. And so I think there are varied approaches. Um, you need to look at organizations' different needs and their different goals, whether they're large, whether they're medium, what type of industry they're in. Um, but I think the two key themes that we heard, um, you know, in terms of, of surprises were the accountability and deploying resources bit. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and moving on to a couple more questions that we do have time for. Um, in your view, uh, based on the outcome of the output of the study, how can procurement perhaps set itself up to work more effectively as a key contributor, a key stakeholder, um, to help improvement in those three areas that you've been drawing on uh, within indirect spend? Yeah. I think the first thing I would say is uh, is communication. I think you know it it, it links into creating um, the culture, uh, the right culture, the right behaviours. But communicate with um, people in your business. Communicate the opportunities for them if they comply with the preferred supplier list. If they comply with the contracted rates. If they share. Um, you know their business and commercial needs with you to, na to enable you as a procurement professional to better procure and make the processes more efficient. So first thing I would say is communication. I think um, the other thing is think about how you structure um, your procurement organization. And you know again, it depends on the size of the organization, it depends on the industry you are in, but potentially you know create areas of expertise create individual um, procurement professionals for specific lines of business or specific sectors of procurement. Um, so for example, you know, you might want to bring marketing professionals in to support procuring um, marketing and advertising uh, work. Um, so use specialist expertise. And I think, you know, the other thing is take procurement seriously as a business. For those of you um, who are not procurement professionals, you know, make sure that you are giving time to those procurement individuals within your business. Make sure that you are giving them a place at the table. And then I think it's really about accountability, um, making sure that procurement have the ability to hold the business accountable for adhering or not adhering to, uh, to supplier lists or to contracted rates. Thank you very much indeed. And I think as well, just to add, um, add on to that, um, our observation at SharedServicesLink.com is that a lot of organizations that will now start kind of falling into the uh, the upper quartile of a Hackett study as far as best practice is concerned will be treating finance and procurement in a much more aligned, joined up fashion. So just to add on to some of those elements that Katrina has provided there. Um, making sure that procurement and finance, uh, as, as Katrina talked about there, open up the communication channels much more and actually under, have an understanding of each other's language and an understanding of each other's goals and, um, and targets. And having combined, actually having kind of combined purchase to pay goals and targets. So we're seeing a number of shared services organizations actually ditching the title AP, accounts payable, and actually applying account um, purchase to pay uh, to actually define 
the the um, invoice part, if you will, of purchase to pay. We're also seeing organisations where traditional AP is now being managed by a procurement person, and finance people are actually being embedded within within the procurement function. So we're slowly seeing uh, the towers that used to the walls that used to surround these silos and surround these towers of of what was procurement and what was accounts payable come down because there is this appreciation now that um, accounts payable, for example, can only really be as good as its procurement colleagues and the activities that go, go on there, and vice versa. Procurement really does depend on accounts payable to help them police uh, processes and manage processes and help, help them um, educate everybody on the importance of being compliant with uh, their actual process involvement. I'm afraid we are now out of questions, uh, time for questions. Um, so I would also just like to wrap this up with a highlight of what we've got coming up at sharedservicesLink.com. More exciting webinars coming up before we break for summer. And uh, our next one, please do join us next week for the Q8, the, uh, the petroleum organization uh, that is rolling out e-billing, so electronic invoicing to their customers. And they're being very successful at that, having a huge impact on day sales outstanding. Um, and uh, a couple of other webinars that I'll ask you to put in your diary. We have e-invoicing Europe coming up in two weeks' time. And of course, our first US event taking place in October in Dallas. So uh, thank you very much to Katrina Cliff for the insight into that fascinating uh, report. Uh, we will be sending you out the link following on from this, um, from this webinar. And we look forward to welcoming you next time. Thank you, and goodbye.